Welcome to TopCast. This is a reaction video, a reaction podcast to a Making Sense episode that came out just recently. Uh, in fact, it's the latest one if you happen to be watching this in around, on or around the 15th of July 2022. I like listening to Sam Harris and the Making Sense podcast. Some of the guests are absolutely fantastic at times. There are certain themes that run throughout the podcast and it's a good way to take the temperature, so to speak, of the intellectual zeitgeist at times. I'd like to begin today's episode with, well, it's an unusual episode to begin with, in an unusual way. I've got here my scripts to these original Star Wars trilogy, and there is a point at which uh, Luke Skywalker, the hero, is meeting with Master Yoda on Dagobah, the Dagobah system on the planet there, where Yoda happens to be living, and uh, Luke, of course, is learning how to use the Force, the Force. I like to think of the Force in our optimistic, world, realistic worldview as simply creativity or explanatory knowledge. That's what the Force kind of is. That's the superpower that we have. Anyway, at one point, Yoda is training Luke in the use of the Force, and he's, Luke is uh, coming to be able to levitate stones. And while he's learning to do this, his ship that has crash-landed on the planet sinks into the swamp. And what happens then? Well, let's just read <laughs> read what is said here. Uh, the ship has just sunk into the swamp. And Luke says, oh no, we'll never get it out now. Yoda says, so certain are you. Always with you, it cannot be done. Hear you nothing that I say. Luke says, master, moving stones around is one thing. This is totally different. And Yoda says, no, no different. Only different in your mind. You must unlearn what you have learned, end quote. And, and that's fantastic. Only different in your mind. This is exactly right, that we are able to solve problems in our environment all the time, the little things in our day-to-day -day lives. The only difference between the little things we do in our day-to-day -day lives and the things we're able to solve right now are a matter of scale, a matter of quantitative difference, not qualitative difference, that if the asteroid is heading towards us, the right knowledge created in time will be able to help us avoid the catastrophe that would otherwise happen from a collision of asteroid with the Earth, would be able to deflect the asteroid or something. And I like to use the asteroid as a metaphor for absolutely any other problem, absolutely any other problem. If it's a problem, it can be solved. There will be a solution because problems are soluble. Yoda is the optimist. Luke is the pessimist. And as an optimist, <laughs> you sometimes feel in the role of Yoda. Hear you nothing that I say <laughs> at times. So today I'm taking a walk. It's a beautiful sunny day outside in Sydney today. And as I do, I listen to podcasts, audiobooks and things. I listen to the latest uh, chapter of The Fabric of Reality for uh, the next episode of TopCast on The Fabric of Reality, which is about um, justificationism. And once I got to the end of that, I listened to some uh, comedy podcasts. And I thought, oh, well, I'll listen to Sam's latest one. And the this episode caught my attention. Of course, what we do here a lot at TopCast, at my podcast is explore the clash between the dominant intellectual culture, which, which is absolutely, well, for want of another word, infested by pessimism, and the very, very small number of people who are pushing against that in an optimistic way, saying that problems are soluble. Yes, they exist. They are inevitable, after all. But people are the solution. People are not the problem. People are the solution. And we can solve those problems. And we do solve those problems. Pinker has written eloquently about how we have solved those problems. And Pinker is one of those people who forms part of that minority of people who try to push back against some of the pessimism. But even within this spectrum of optimists, Small in number though they are, an even smaller percentage, I think, really appreciate exactly what the mechanisms are and why it is we can continue to be optimistic and why any particular blip of so-called pessimism or steps backward actually won't last. Anyway, all of that aside, um, this Making Sense episode, this episode of Sam Harris's, it's worth concentrating on. What I'm going to do is just to speak to the introductory remarks that Sam makes to the episode, and then to his guest's introduction as well. Uh, I listened to the whole episode, but I can't go through a point-for-point -point refutation of every single thing that is said there. So much of it is simply 
prophecy. And as we know, prophecy tends towards pessimism, that once you get into the particulars of trying to, for example, say what's going to happen to China over the next few decades, or say what's going to happen to America over the next few decades, or that uh, as the point is made for a rather laborious point made about how America's naval power isn't sufficient to protect trade routes around the world, and therefore this is going to lead to catastrophic decline of global trade over the coming decades. These kind of very specific points, well, I don't know how any of it follows. It's kind of an induction type argument, which doesn't exist. It's not valid. It's merely guessing at the future. It's taking out a crystal ball. And as we know, when people do this, when intellectuals do this, they can foresee all of the problems. They do not foresee the solutions. Anyway, the name of the episode, number 288 from Making Sense, is the end of the global order. And Sam's been talking about this end of the global order a lot recently. Now, there's a sense in which maybe it's just, well, things change over time. So maybe it's good that there's an end to whatever the existing thing is so that something better again, comes along. Perhaps more freedom, more liberty, more capitalism, more creativity, all of that good stuff. Of course, that's not <laughs> what Sam is going to say. That's not what his guests are hinting at. Uh, we're not going to hear from one of the guests. We'll hear from Sam and the author of the book that is being discussed. There is another guest on the podcast as well who tries to serve as a foil, a, a sort of a, a counter to the deep pessimism of the main guest, but really it's just two pessimists fighting it out over who is more pessimistic. And so the purpose of the episode is, and I'm just reading from Sam's own description of the podcast, is he's speaking with Peter Zeehan and Ian Bremer about Peter, Peter Zeehan's new book, The End of the World is Just the Beginning. So you can see why... I would be attracted to something like this. Now, it's not because I like to just continually talk about pessimism and prophecy and the end of the world, but it is important to know what the common thoughts are that are out there, the common misconceptions, I would say, that, that exist out there about how although things have tended to get better, although many people, of course, disagree with that, that, that assumption, you know, there, there are many people in the intellectual community who think that, no, there is no evidence of things getting better. Okay, they're denying reality there. But of those who do admit that there's a reality to that statement, there's truth to that, that in fact things have gotten better, a la Stephen Pinker's writing on this, David Deutsch's work, of course, on this as well, they will nonetheless say that we're at a uniquely dangerous point and all signs are pointing towards global decline, that, that now... Now the Malthusians are going to be right, that now the sky is going to fall, that now the global order is going to end and we're all going to be in poverty and there's going to be a third world war and things are just going to get worse and worse and worse, that now we're going to be right, namely the pessimists are going to be proved correct. So I had this bizarre experience anyway today, walking outside in the bright sunshine, sunshine as I say, um, listening to this podcast. Sam begins, uh, it's about five minutes of um, uh, just explaining the, the great things that uh, are done on the Waking Up app and uh, advertising the, the podcast more broadly, all that, uh, before he gets into actually, before he gets into uh, actually introducing uh, the, the episode, the episode proper. And as soon as he begins doing this, although it's all very serious and it's about the end of glo the global order, <laughs> um, I just began laughing out loud. So I'm looking like a crazy person walking along the street, just laughing out loud in a way that I hadn't been laughing at Conan O'Brien's podcast, which I'd just been listening to, which was hilarious. <laughs> but I was really laughing out loud at Sam Harris's stuff. Now, no disrespect to Sam. It's just the contrast between the things I normally talk about and the way I normally talk about them and the kind of themes that run through just – Everything I talk about on Topcast, the things that I have talked about with uh, Navarro Ravikant, the things that David Deutsch has written about. So this is what my mind is typically filled with, okay, those kind of ideas. And so when I encounter the precise opposite to these things, it's so jarring that 
you laugh. <laughs> it, well, I laugh anyway. And so it, it, it's just the whole other worldview comes in, comes screaming into view, and I'm knocked out of my optimistic slumber, so to speak. Uh, and I have to remember, I, I know at an intellectual level that this is the way that the overwhelming majority of intellectuals really do think. And this is what, therefore, People who tend to listen to podcasts like this, this is what they're being fed. And this is what people think. This is what people really do think. And this is the way, this is what motivates the way people vote. This is what motivates the way people purchase stuff, what they invest in. All of this kind of stuff is motivated by a particular ideology, a particular philosophy, in particular about decline and Americans, if nothing else, an entire side of politics over there, seems to be motivated largely by denigrating America itself. There's an anti-American streak unique to the United States. Perhaps it comes in part from the philosophies of continental Europe, where there is this is very anti-nation state, very anti-freedom, all that sort of stuff that comes out of Europe. And, and uh, the United States inherits part of that, at least one side of politics there inherits part of that. One side of politics there tends more in the direction of the British tradition of the Enlightenment, so they tend to be more optimistic. It's not a strict split, but you take my meaning. Let's not get onto politics, however. But it is, it is interesting just to observe this kind of way of speaking about their own exceptional nation that exists there in the United States, and I know uh, a majority of my audience is from the United States. It, it, perhaps living there for so long, people just don't realise how special it is. Now, of course, there are people who visit the United States from Europe who still insist that it's not a particularly special place, but we know it is. It is unique on the face of the planet. It is unique on the face of the planet right now in terms of its wealth and power. In terms of innovation, it continues that tradition that began in Britain and has spread throughout the Anglosphere and Enlightenment nations more broadly, even in Europe and even across parts of Asia as well. Innovation is something the United States does still, I would say, better than just about anywhere else in the world, with maybe a few exceptions in other parts of the world at times, at times. So some of us struggle to understand why it is Americans are so keen to talk down their own exceptional country, their own exceptional nation. Then again, Australians do it as well, and the British are very, very good at this. This is something Anglosphere nations are good at. The people of uh, nations that speak English are very, very good at uh, is talking down their own exceptional nations. Uh, to what extent Asian countries do this, I don't know. I've, I've heard that you know the places like Spain, for example, will talk down their country while they're in it, but if they travel outside, then they'll talk it up. Okay, so there there is that interesting cultural difference as well. I don't know if the I don't know if English speaking peoples tend to do this. Maybe they do. Whatever the case, let's get on to listening to um, the first approximately just ten minutes or so, just ten minutes of this making sense episode. Again, just going to listen to Sam's introduction to the episode, and then to to Peter, his guest introduce his book and then that'll be it okay but i'm going to be pausing it along the way and i would encourage you of course to listen to the episode in full well worth listening to to get the other side of the argument especially for the things i'm going to say here and again full respect to the people that i um, am inevitably going to laugh at some of what is said here okay but um only in good fun i think we need to have good fun with this because i think that uh, the, what I'm laughing at is the, by, as I say, the most common intellectual opinion that's out there right now. So they shouldn't be worried about, you know, someone with a tiny little podcast like mine laughing at them. Okay, let's begin. Today we're talking about the end of the world as we know it. <laughs> so there we go. There we go. Um, straight away, you know, no, no hedges, nothing like that. We're straight into talking about the end of the world as we know it. Now, as I say, there could be an optimistic sense in which this can be interpreted. The end of the world as we know it, so that it ushers in an even better world of more freedom, more trade, greater creativity, faster solution to our problems, increased rate of progress, all of that great stuff. That could be the end of the world as we know it. In fact, every single new day could be an end of the world as we know it. Of course, this is not what people mean. This is not what the pessimists mean. You know, uh, Ever since, you know, I sort of grew up in the 80s, we 
often heard the phrase end of the world as we know it. You know, REM did that song, The End of the World as We Know It. You know, it's, uh, this whole idea that nuclear war could take us out. And now, of course, we've got the long list of different ways in which we might all die. Okay, so the end of the world as we know it. Let's keep going. That really is not much of an exaggeration. Because today I'm speaking with Peter Zion and Ian Bremmer. Uh, and we're focusing on Peter's new book titled The End of the World is Just the Beginning which is a fairly dire look at the implications of deglobalization and demographic collapse. As I say at the beginning, I invited Ian to help co-host this episode, essentially, because so much of what Peter has written about is just not in my wheelhouse. So I invited Ian to ride shotgun with me, which happily he did, uh, and I thought it was a great conversation. We tracked through a lot of what's in Peter's book, why deglobalization is happening, why he's so confident that it will continue to happen, uh, how it has different implications for countries like China versus countries like America. So this idea that deglobalization is happening, so whether or not that's true is something we could grapple with. There can be blips in things like, well, the Ukraine war that's happening as of 2022. But is this a sign of something far more broad? Are these kind of things the sign of something more broad? I, 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 I get deliveries from Amazon almost on the daily. Is that a sign of the decline of globalism? Ever since the 2000s and where the, the internet age has really taken off, it doesn't seem to me like progress has slowed. It doesn't seem to me like globalism is in decline. Whatever these metrics are, people can pick any metric they like. And focus on that and to say, well, haha, that is the sign of a declining globalism. This is, a, this is a demographic change, whatever these signs happen to be. That's one thing. We can debate whether or not these particular metrics, picked, selected carefully, in order to make a point. We're not talking about all of the different metrics and all of the different ways in which we could talk about how things are getting better and how globalization is increasing, not decreasing. Uh, putting all of that aside, even if we could agree that these are the metrics that indicate global globalization decline, something like that, a, a reduction in global trade, that is absolutely no reason to presume that such a pattern is going to continue. That's predicting stock markets. That's predicting the choices of people. That's predicting knowledge creation. That's induction. It's completely invalid. It's not a thing. The past does not resemble the future. We know this. We have this trend in the stock market that tends to go up, but there are these down bits as well that just happen. Why? Because the world's unpredictable. We encounter problems that can't be seen ahead of time. And so when those problems are encountered, whether they be war, viruses, Poor responses to viruses from politicians that cause a reduction in global trade and a retreat behind national lines. The election of particularly poor political leaders. These things are the blips that cause the downs. But, there is, but, but politicians can only do so much damage, is my thought. Bad political decisions can only achieve so much the tend towards socialism in this day and age can only undo so much progress. People are coming to understand that individual freedom, wealth creation, really are able to cause the up uh, part of that graph when, when you're talking about the increase in overall wealth, health, well-being, uh, the, 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 the robust um, performance of the stock market, that kind of thing. But in particular... Individual and global wealth is increasing, absolutely increasing. The number of people starving in various places around the world has continued to decrease. Their wealth has continued to increase. The, the, the poorest people in the world, among the poorest people in the world, I should say, among the poorest people in the world, have access to the internet via smartphones, wireless technology. That will continue a pace. And there are simply, it's simply not the case modulo bad decisions of politicians in particular countries, that people are going without food, medical care, clean water, that kind of thing. Yes, there are still pockets where that is true. But since the 80s, when there really were huge famines, 
going on in places like Ethiopia, where violence was far more pervasive than it is today. These things are the exception to the rule. But Ukraine, the war in Ukraine is just so noticeable because it's so unusual. So unusual. A few decades ago, that would have been regarded as a small skirmish in the greater scheme of things when it came to something like the Second World War. And compared to something like in the 90s, the war in Iraq, my goodness, the war in Ukraine is terrible as it is, not on that scale. Simply not on that scale. As I record this episode, there are political eruptions in Sri Lanka. Okay, exception to the rule. Exception to the rule of the majority of the world is made up of nations that are very stable and prospering. Prospering. As I record this, there has been a huge amount of inflation in places. Why? Well, shouldn't one expect that after forcing people to stay at home during a global pandemic? That was apparently the only option. Uh, The pandemic could have been far worse than what it was. It could have been a more virulent strain and all that sort of stuff. And things could have been worse. They were pretty bad. People were kept at home. Productivity was reduced. The government stepped in and started paying people for doing nothing for staying at home. So, of course, there's inflation because the governments of the world were printing money, in particular in the United States. And so you have this huge inflation going on. That's what happens when you print money. That's what happens. We know that. Now, all we need is for the politicians to make some different decisions. Now, whether and how quickly that happens... Who knows? But we have every reason to think that productivity is not going to go down, to continue to go down. People understand now, despite what the media says, despite the scaremongering that that continues, that things will continue to get better. That we have vaccines now, for example. So people can work and people can work from home also. Very importantly, that's that's something that's been figured out. That so much of what was being done from offices can now be done at home and perhaps more efficiently and better than ever before. People realise that so much can be delivered to their homes now rather than having to go to stores. There's all ways in which, you know, COVID was absolutely a bad thing. But out of that came new solutions, creativity, to push progress forward. So we can pick and choose our data here, or data, our evidence, and paint a picture of a world going to rack and ruin, as the prophets have always done, as the pessimists have always done. And us optimists can also be accused of that, picking and choosing our data. But the thing is that whether we pick and choose our data, there can nothing can be we cannot deny the fact that things have continued to get better, broadly speaking. That wherever there are these particular declines in wealth and well-being, that overall the broad trend, trend over centuries and especially recent decades, is accelerating progress and improvement across, yes, the Western countries, but the entire world. People being lifted out of poverty. This is a story of happiness, progress, prosperity, increased wealth, increased peace. You really have to do some work to deny all that and to say that all of these are indications of things becoming worse and that things will become worse in some way, shape, or form. Maybe it's that the pessimists think that the the, the global warming catastrophe isn't cutting it anymore, that we need to, if we're going to compel people to vote for socialist-type policies, then if COVID wasn't enough, if environmentalism isn't enough, then we're going to have to hit them with the end of the global world order. Maybe then they'll come around. Maybe then they'll start voting the correct way and start thinking the way that we do. Well, hopefully not. (laughs) Let's continue. Let's continue. Uh, And as you'll hear, there are not too many countries like America in his estimation. And there's a long discussion on the implications of demography and demographic collapse. And just what is the relationship between labor and consumption and investment and urbanization? What does the world look like? with shrinking populations. As you'll hear, it is a bracing and fairly alarming picture of guaranteed disorder and scarcity. Guaranteed 
disorder and scarcity. Guaranteed. Declining populations. Now, I hear about this all the time. Elon Musk is worried about this, amongst other things. I'm not worried about declining populations. You know? um, people are creative entities. The, the, the great concern is that if you've got this, these older people who can't be supported in their old age because they're useless and can't work, this is literally the, the argument, right? These old people won't be working, they'll be unproductive, and they'll have to be supported by a younger generation. But there's not enough of the younger generation to support them. Really? Is this what we think of our elderly people? Is this, is this really what we think? We're thinking of them as a burden. Is that what we're going to say about people, human beings, creative human beings? It's wrong to start with, okay, but older people can absolutely contribute. And more and more, every single year, we see older people remaining in the workforce. We are minds, not bodies, our bodies can decay and our medicine is becoming better and our technology is becoming better anyway to make these older people more robust as they age. That's one thing. Our technology is going to be at a point where so much of what we do is automated. These concerns that people have that, oh, there's not going to be enough young people to support the old people in old age and therefore we've got this problem with population decline and... Uh, by the way, <laughs> we can also add into this... If the artificial intelligence people are right, and artificial general intelligence is around the corner, of course, I don't think this, but I do think artificial general intelligence is possible, then we'll have a new kind of person, won't we? The robotic kind of person that'll solve all those problems anyway. It's not guaranteed at all. What Sam and Peter cannot foresee, and Elon cannot foresee, is infinite. I can't foresee it either. But what I do know is that the people that exist today are as creative as we ever have been, more so perhaps because we're less encumbered by anti-rational memes. So we're thinking more creatively, not less. So this, this entire concern and therefore pessimism about the future is completely misplaced, utterly misplaced, and, and depends upon us thinking that the distant future occupied by a large population of older people and a smaller population of younger people is basically going to be the same as today, where we need to have these welfare programs of older people being unproductive and getting paid by the state using money produced by or wealth produced by the younger people. And by the way, maybe that is possible. Let's assume that the worst terrible case scenario uh, does come true. Maybe the rate of knowledge production will be just so great that that will be a possible situation in which f for us all to live. We'll have the robots and so on to do the caring of those older people at almost zero cost. If we have fusion power, then these robots can be plugged into the fusion reactors charged up by super efficient lithium batteries of the future. This won't be a problem. It will have been solved. There will be a solution. They're worrying now about problems of the far distant future and how we're going to solve those in the future now useless focus now on the problem on the problems now that's not a problem now and insofar as it is a problem somewhere now like japan they happen to be solving it look into that uh, and they also have this nice culture of looking after their older people as well which we could probably learn from in the west i would say okay so this claim that uh, there's a guarantee, a guarantee of things going badly is completely wrong, utterly wrong. It's not based upon a good explanation. It's based upon a misconception about how knowledge is created and how extrapolations can be made, generalizations are produced. It's assuming that one can use this thing called induction, that the past resembles the future, and yet the past does not resemble the future. We absolutely know that. Okay, let's go to the next clip. And uh, there's also some discussion about the significance of the war in Ukraine and, and other recent developments there. Anyway, I found it fascinating. I hope you enjoy it. Peter Zion is a geopolitical strategist and founder of the consulting firm Zion on Geopolitics. His clients include energy corporations, financial institutions, business associations, agricultural interests, universities, and the U.S. military. People have every right to make a quid, earn money, uh, you know, generate wealth, personal wealth for themselves. 
it, we are in an age where absolutely saying how things are going to go terribly and I'm the person who can tell you what's going to go badly and how you can mitigate the risk, I tell you what, there, there is, there's a dollar in that and there's a lot of people out there doing it. Entire consulting firms exist for that purpose. For, for, for little more than telling people about the risks of the future and how bad things are going to get. Give me a few dollars and I will forecast things. That's, I'm sorry to say, this is fortune telling. This is modern corporate fortune telling. That's what's going on here. They can have graphs and statistics all day long. But as soon as they start making forecasts about the future... It's prophecy. It doesn't matter what the facts of today are. We can all agree on those. But just because you are in possession of a particular set of facts that you've looked up, you've gone to the trouble of looking up Wikipedia or whatever to find out how many destroyers are in the US Navy, let's say, and you call yourself a global strategist, this does not give you any greater insight into what's going to happen 30 years from now because you don't know what scientific discoveries, uh, much less any other discovery, is going to be made in those next few decades. No one does. But I tell you what, if, if human civilization is anything to go by, then whatever the problems of the future will be solved and we will encounter problems of the future and we will solve them, creating new knowledge which makes the place a heck of a lot better than what it is now. Unimaginably so. Just as we stand in relation to the people of the 1930s and the people of the 1930s stand in relation to the people of the 1230s. This is the kind of difference we should expect over the coming decades. A continual ramping up of progress and innovation in ways we cannot possibly foresee today, but which is going to make everything a lot better by all of our lines. But we'll still have the pessimists then, I guess. Because we, <laughs> if there's one thing I can be pessimistic about, it's that we're going to win the argument. <laughs> but hey, um, I, I suppose it, it keeps, if it keeps them in business, okay, if they're, you know, if the, if the pessimists are being uh, kept in good employ by telling us about how badly things are going, then, you know, some of us can earn a fraction of the amount by telling you why it is that they're wrong. <laughs> And they are wrong. They are wrong. They're absolutely wrong. Okay, let's keep going. He is the author of The Accidental Superpower, The Absent Superpower, Disunited Nations, and most recently, The End of the World is Just the Beginning. The Accidental Superpower. So I'd say, I haven't read these books, okay, but it just sounds you know, anti-American, as I say. Um, Disunited Nations, yeah, 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 for sure. If it's about the United Nations, who wants the United Nations? Who wants that? anti-democratic institution. I suppose it serves a purpose, where it serves a good purpose. <laughs> it's open to question. Okay, let's get going. Ian Bremer is president and founder of Eurasia Group, a leading global research and consulting firm, and G Zero Media, a company dedicated to providing intelligent and engaging coverage of international affairs. He currently teaches at Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs, and he has published 10 books including the New York Times bestseller, Us Versus Them, The Failure of Globalism. And his most recent book is The Power of Crisis, How Three Threats and Our Response Will Change the World. Ian is also a foreign affairs columnist and editor-at-large for Time magazine. Apologies for some of the audio, especially on Peter's side. Peter's in the middle of a book tour, and we were unable to send him the gear we usually send to guests. So it sounds more like a phone call on his end, but his words are clear enough. And now I bring you Peter Zion and Ian Bremer. I am here with Peter Zion and Ian Bremer. Peter, Ian, thanks for joining me. It's great hey. to be here. Good to be with you guys. Peter, the occasion for this conversation is your fairly astounding new book, the title of which is The End of the World is Just the Beginning, uh, which I read last week. And um, I knew I wanted to speak with you. I also knew that I am not uh, uh, entirely qualified 
to uh, absorb every aspect of your thesis. I mean, you, you cover so many topics which are really not my wheelhouse, things like geography and manufacturing and agriculture and industrial materials, etc. So I, I, I invited Ian on really to kind of co-pilot the plane with me here and be a backstop against uh, some of my ignorance about uh, these matters. And Ian is a, a frequent guest on the podcast. So uh, it's great to talk to you both. I, I think before, I mean, I'll just, see, I, I'd like you to roll out your thesis a, as you present it in the book at kind of a high level at the beginning here. I guess I'll just kick you off. So, yeah, part of the book, I haven't read the book. Okay, I, I've listened to the podcast. I haven't read the book. So, you know, maybe my entire philosophy about how civilization works could be undone by his book. I doubt it. But but there's certainly, as Sam indicates, there's something about you know, manufacturing and resources and that kind of thing. You know, and, and changes which Peter seems to think indicate a trend towards things becoming worse off, or us all becoming worse off. Remember the parable of Europium from the beginning of infinity. You know, this whole idea that it was thought that the number of Color screens was limited because one of the pixels in colored screens in um, cathode ray tubes was red and red contained europium and the amount of europium on planet Earth was limited. Therefore, the number of colored screens would be limited. Mathematically provable. Yeah. Uh, it seems like the arguments might be like that, right? You, you've got this resource or you've got this way of manufacturing and it's, you know, there's, a, there's an end point to it and therefore things are going to go bad when we reach the end of that particular resource or when we reach the end of that particular way of doing things. Not thinking that people are creative. And so we come up with a new resource. This is why I say resources are infinite. Now, any given resource on you know, finite space is, of course, limited. On Earth, there's a certain amount of europium. On Earth, there's a certain amount of matter, by definition. It's the Earth, okay? It's no bigger than the Earth. It's the Earth. But the universe is not so limited. People are already talking about mining asteroids, but never mind that. We can learn new ways of repurposing matter and coming to understand matter in better ways. That what we thought wasn't a resource becomes a resource simply by learning new ways of using it. This is what nuclear physics is about, right? Among other things. And if there's a way of doing things that seems to be unsustainable or use whatever word you like, it's not like we won't come up with a new way of doing stuff. If constructor theory works out, we'll have the universal constructor and we'll be building absolutely anything using the, you know, the generalization of the 3D printer. And these devices will be in homes and things will be radically different, radically transformed and radically for the better. We've talked about this, you know, Go all in with constructor theory rather than with the pessimists and see where your imagination leaves you then. With pessimism, you're left with a wall that civilization declines to the point of becoming extinct. Something like constructor theory, which has the implication of a universal constructor, which can be created and, and will be created in some timeline, perhaps ours, then you have a civilization that is unbounded that only continues to get better. And this is why we say that all we have to do is try harder, make the right choices, create the right knowledge, things get better. All right, let's keep going. By reminding you that one of the, the more provocative and unequivocal things you say in the book, among many provocative and unequivocal things, is that, quote, the world of the past few decades is the best the world is ever going to be in our lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> unequivocal maybe this this is what one needs to do as a prophet and a prophet tends towards pessimism you have to be more and more unequivocal you have to be less and less a fallibilist these things are all tied together the desire to predict the far distant future where knowledge is absolutely going to have an impact where the creativity of people is going to have an impact which we don't call prediction, we call prophecy for a reason. Ignoring possible solutions because they can't be imagined now, therefore tending in the direction of pessimism. 
requires one to also be absolutely certain that they're not wrong, to deny the possibility of fallibilism, or at least to downplay it, maybe to intellectually give it a check off. I could be wrong about this. However, all the signs are that I'm not. Something like that. So I'll just I'll re- rewind a little bit and then we'll keep going because uh, I'm interrupting at a crucial point. You know, he, uh, Sam's summarising how. You know, we, we <laughs> this is the best the world is ever going to get. How many times has that been said? That that is the history of pessimism for the last few centuries. People are the problem, not the solution. That. We live in an especially dangerous time. Things are only going to get worse. It just every generation comes up with their intellectuals that they hold up as here's the guy, usually the guy, here's the guy that is telling you that everything's going to go wrong. Enjoy it while you can because it's all about to fall apart. The Malthusians of the world, you know, Thomas Malthus. He was wrong in the 1700s. Every one of his intellectual successes has been wrong ever since. He had graphs and mathematical proofs, as they do now. He had lots of data, as they do now. They're always wrong. They are always wrong because they cannot imagine the explanations yet to be generated to create the solutions yet to be found and the technologies to make everything better. But that's what inevitably happens. That's the fundamental, deep l- law of epistemology, and 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 what is governing, what is governing the way in which civilization is behaving. We error correct when we c- encounter the problem. We find the solution. When we identify the error, we solve it. We we, we correct it. We make things better. That's what. But people are unique. We're unique. Uh, okay, <laughs> let's keep going. Is that, quote, the world of the past few decades is the best the world is ever going to be in our lifetime. And uh, so basically your, your claim that surfaces throughout the book is that the world as we n- have known it ended more or less in 2019 and there is no going back. And globally speaking, more or less everything that matters is going to get worse and it's going to be worse for the rest of our lives. Whether they're, they're, as we'll hear, that you posit that there'll be islands of relative advantage and, and America is going to do much better than China, for instance. <laughs> what to say? I mean, how can you know based upon any set of facts today, whatever the set of facts are today? I could imagine a set of facts about the real world today that are worse than what the real world is now. I can imagine the state of the world right now being worse than what it is and yet still thinking that things will get better. And yet somehow, this magnificent world that we do have, problems though we do have, admittedly, problems though we do have, uh, is not in a worse place than things were in the Second World War. And yet, from the Second World War through to today, things have gotten better, continually better, at an accelerating rate. The starting point of the Second World War is way worse, right? Now... We're so, we're so far ahead of that. And somehow being so far ahead of that terrible tragedy and that terrible starting point, is all signs point to decline? No, <laughs> precisely the opposite. However much money you were going to place on the bet that things were going to get better at the conclu- 1940, you know, 1945, at the conclusion of the Second World War, Whatever money you would have put on things getting better then, you should be putting a million times more money on things getting better right now. It's a far better bet to say things are going to get better over the next 50 years now than it would have been back in the the 40s. And yet things did get better in the 40s. In the 80s, the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s, the, the middle of the Cold War, again, all signs seem to suggest, well, according to some intellectuals anyway, Nuclear winter was coming because the bombs were about to start flying between the USSR and the United States. And everyone else in the world would be caught in the crossfire. It would be the end of the world as we knew it, in a bad way. And yet, the Berlin Wall fell. There was the, 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 the entire Iron Curtain fell. <laughs> you know, the USSR collapsed. Things got better, a lot better, and continue to get better. And yet now, 
Uh, we've got the rise of China. Okay. Mm, possibly better than what the USSR was. Possibly better. I mean, at least, yeah, China does have a strong uh, capitalist bent in some way. Certainly not capitalist, but I mean, look at Shanghai, look at Beijing. I mean, you know, to look at it, it's not the grey concrete of the typical socialist country. They understand that free markets do something. And the people there understand that life can be better. And with the information age, they know a lot more now. How much longer will they tolerate this totalitarian government? Don't know. Could things get worse in the meantime? Yeah, but I think they'll get better, ultimately. Uh, uh, the proximate set of circumstances might be decline. But the ultimate set of circumstances for China and the Chinese people will be better. So you, it's to say that right now is the best that life is ever going to be is absolute prophecy. It is created for a market that exists right now where people want to hear about how everything's going to go to rack and ruin. I don't know precisely why. I don't have an answer for that. I've said that it's got something perhaps to do with our impulse to see disaster movies, but I can't explain it all. That's just a frivolous line I sometimes say. You know, we like to go and see Deep Impact. We like to go and see, you know, the, the movies about... Uh, the aliens coming and wiping out human civilization or the asteroid coming or the, 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 the big volcano going off. We like to watch movies like that. It's entertaining. So we like to listen to podcasts like this as well about how everything's going to get worse. It's exhilarating. People like that. It's a, it tickles them in a certain way, you know, to get a little bit depressed, a little bit anxious, worried, concerned, and perhaps to feel a little bit intellectual too, to be able to go out to your friends and family and talk about this stuff, about how, oh, I listen to Sam Harris talk about how, you know, everything's going to get really, really bad. And uh, uh, Joe Rogan picks up on it and, uh, you know, uh, comedians like Tim Dillon make a, a big comedy and I love listening to Tim Dillon because he takes it to the extreme. I, I, I like a comedian dealing with this kind of stuff because I think that's the best way for it to be treated at times because it's so extreme some of the claims are so extreme like this how can this how can one not laugh at this how can one not see that it's just the latest in a long tradition of precisely this kind of claim being made that it's absolutely certain that you live at the best point in human history as i say malthus was saying this in 1730s predicting that the world would be out of food by the early 1900s. And instead, the exact opposite happened. More people than ever have been lifted out of poverty and famine. And that will continue apace. That your standard of living today, uh, the standard of living of the typical millionaire living on the west coast of the United States will seem as if to be the most poverty-stricken person imaginable in the year 2200 in the year 2200 they will be looking back at the year 2022 and thinking how did those people tolerate living like that with a life expectancy of only 80 something years old only having you know an income of six figures five figures six figures each year how could they tolerate that how did they get by <laughs> <laughs> vehicles that were, you know, private vehicles that they had to drive. You know, it would seem like the horse and cart, right? You know, you know, all we have to do is to hop into this vehicle and it takes us wherever we go at the press of a button. Wires. <laughs> name name the, the thing that will seem ridiculous to people in the year 2020, 2200. And yet, if intellectuals today of 2022 are to be believed, the year 2200 is going to be a terrible hellscape, an apocalyptic nightmare. Of, of starvation and poverty. It's not. It's not. Why? Not because I'm making a prediction about specifics. I'm saying this is what civilization does. This is the way in which knowledge is created. What happens is people identify errors, problems, then solve them. This is what we do. Now, unless we all cease to exist, okay, then the world will go into decline. What does decline mean in a world without people? But so long as people are here, we use the background knowledge that we have and improve upon it. Improve. Improve by finding the deficiencies in it. And once we do that, then not only does our knowledge get better, but everything that our knowledge 
creates in the world, the physical stuff, the artifacts, the technology also gets better. Solving literal problems like disease and how to grow more food and produce more stuff and just make everything more comfortable and better and fly to the stars. Let's get going. But basically the sky really is falling on your account. So I would, I'd love you just to jump in and give us a, a first pass at this argument. Of course. So uh, let's start at the beginning. Before World War II, global trade in the way that we think of it today did not exist. There was no manufacturer's trade, certainly not supply chains. Energy and agriculture tended to be kept in-house. You, if you wanted something, you went out and you took it, colonized it, you expanded into empire, and those empires clashed. Those clashes brought us the destruction of the world wars and the end of the imperial era. At the end of that conflict, the Americans proposed a new way of functioning. Instead of everyone having to have their own sequestered, protected, militarized, convoyed systems, the U.S. would use its navy, which was the only one of size to survive the war, and would protect everyone's commerce everywhere at any time, no matter who you wanted to partner with, where you wanted to go, where you wanted to sell. This is a bizarre reading of history, that there wasn't global trade before this. What was the Dutch East India Company? What were the British doing uh, prior to the Second World War and the First World War, for that matter. They were globally trading, absolutely. The Chinese were globally trading, for goodness sake. Technology increased, and sure, there was a, an uptick in the amount of global trading, but this denial of the existence of global trade before this, I don't understand. I guess I have to read his book to see where he's coming from. But there has been by his own admission there, an improvement in things. Even if we were to grant the idea that after the Second World War, something particularly special happened when it came to global trade, well, that's, a, that's an admission of improvement, that things have improved since then. And for some reason, we should expect that this is going to come to an end, that this global trade that has served us so well, that any nation can see is far superior to as one might say, simply going out and taking the stuff insofar as that happened. Because again, it depends upon the way in which one wants to read history. And of course, there are these history wars that go on. Is it really the case that the conquistadors were simply stealing stuff? Is that really what was going on? Was there trade? Was it a kind of trade? The Incas still exist as modern day Bolivians and Peruvians. Was there trade that went on then? Well, let's get going. If, in exchange, you would serve as cannon fodder in the Cold War, we bribed up an alliance, and it worked. But the Cold War ended 30 years ago, and we've been backing away ever since. And in every presidential election, we have gone with the more populist candidate, and I would not exclude Biden from that statement. This is a particular way of reading history. It has a very particular spin, a very kind of anti-American idea, this idea that they're going with the populist candidate. Trump was the populist. Uh, Biden was the populist. What's the alternative? What does populist mean? Uh, Douglas Murray's made this point. Does it just mean popular? Yeah. It's, it, and again, it, it hints at this idea that, oh, these, the mob out there, the demos, the, the citizenry, they're making the wrong decision. How dare they elect the most popular candidate? Or the person that is speaking to them in some way, they should be electing the erudite person. Now, look, I you know, have my very, very few preferred politicians, someone like Daniel Hannan in the UK, he's in the House of Lords now, so... Yeah, not running for political office as such. But someone like that would be a better candidate by the metric of seems to have a good understanding of history and economics and so on and so forth. Uh, rare, it would seem. America's certainly made some interesting choices over the recent years. Don't want to get into politics. But this reading of history as America in decline and America stepping back they are, remain far and away the most powerful military power in the world, far and away the biggest economy, most powerful economy, the technological hub of planet Earth. 
but I guess they also hold the title for country most run down by their own citizens. Their own citizens constantly saying how terrible the place is and how much in decline it is. People say this about Britain too. You know, they're always you know, running down Britain saying, oh, Britain in decline, they used to be an empire and now they're in decline. Britain is more powerful today than it ever has been. This idea that, you know, because flags were planted on distant places somehow made the nation more powerful than what it is today is ridiculous. It's a technological powerhouse. It's a democratic powerhouse. It has more wealth than it ever has before, even when it had access to, it had direct control over those other territories. Let's keep going. Okay, let's just go back. Because he actually says there about the United States. Let's just hear that again. And I would not exclude Biden from that statement. We're done. We're done. We're done. Really? The United States is done. Ugh. Okay. And at the time that the Ukraine war started, we actually had fewer troops stationed abroad than at any time since Reconstruction. Isn't that good? Isn't that good to have fewer troops stationed around the world than at any time before that? Doesn't that indicate that the world is becoming more peaceful? Not requiring such a proliferation of American military power to be in different places. America's got a base in Seoul in South Korea. Why? Because, you know, in case of North Korea's attack, there's still American troops based in Germany. But why? Why? To, to prevent the Germans from doing what they shouldn't do? Something like that. There's a historical, there's a historic leftover of troops there. But one can well understand why you would reduce troop numbers in a place like Germany. Now, you want to have a presence there in Europe as the United States in case of Russian aggression, as we've seen. But there's a very good reason why, if you're the United States, the government of the United States, and parents of troops, you would be saying, hey, there's no reason for us to have troops over there. It's much more peaceful now than it ever has been over there. We don't need the troops there anymore. That's a good thing. That's progress. That, that is the spreading of peace around the world. So what he's saying in terms of decline, we can just counter that. We'd say, this is not evidence of decline. This reduction in troop numbers is not an evidence of military power decline on the part of the United States. It's an evidence of increased peace in the world. Where, military, where, where foreign militaries don't have to be at the border of the skirmishes because the skirmishes are stopped. And people, instead of warring with each other, are trading with each other. So the American commitment to this sort of structure, which was always a security structure for us, is now gone. Second, that structure changed the way we live in a pre-World War II, pre-urbanized, pre-industrial system. Everyone lived on the farm and kids were free labor, so you had a lot of them. But when globalization happened, urbanization happened, and everyone took those industrial and service jobs and manufacturing jobs in the cities. And when you move into a condo, kids are no longer free labor. They're just a really expensive headache. Adults aren't dumb, so we had fewer of them. Well, this, is, this, is, this is what passes for you know, um, the analysis of why people are having less children. Fewer children, rather. Fewer. Children of free labor. Um, we don't need the free labor anymore. Um, people... Are sources of people are creativity sources of ideas. People have fewer children today because they understand what it takes to care for a child. People care more about their children. It j just genuinely is. I know it's it's an unpopular opinion, but you know, you certain civilizations care more about their children than others. Certain generations care more about their children than others. Going back a thousand years, people cared much less about their children. Going back generations, people cared less about their children. They would have more and more. It would cost them more and more. All the children would live, uh, uh, have a worse standard of living because you'd have 10 or 12 children you'd have to look after, Much, many more mouths to feed, less food to go around. You knew that not all of them were going to survive. You clearly didn't care about them all uh, in the way that people care about their children today. People have less children today because they, they want their children to have a good standard of living, better than what they had. And if you have three or two or even one child, you can really look after that child so much better than if you have 10 of them. Of course, you can spend more time with them. This is a good thing. This is progress.
I've got nothing against people having huge families. Great. Some people maybe can, you know, look after that number of children and, and, and give them, you know, eight children the same attention. Mum and or dad is able to stay at home. Great. Often these days, of course, mum and or dad work. And so time is spread thin to spend with the children. So therefore, you know, you have the one or the two or the three and the time you have is so much more precious. The children are so much more precious. Again, looking at the same data, the completely opposite uh, implication can be drawn. Not a sign of decline, a sign of progress and improvement. Betterment for human civilization. You fast forward that 75 years and it's not that we're running out of children. That happened 40 years ago. It's that we're running out of adults. And we do not have an economic theory for what a world where the retirees outnumber the children and the adults looks like. No, but we'll, 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 we'll solve the problems as they are encountered. Trying to foresee the problem of the distant future and come up with a solution now is a recipe for pessimism because you can't imagine the solution now because you don't know all the conditions for the future. I've already mentioned Elon Musk, but he makes exactly the same mistake. It doesn't matter in the future if there are more old people than young people. We don't have an economic model. Who cares? Economic models are very not, not of much use, not of much use at all in helping us to actually navigate the waters of how civilization can run. Civilization is quite happy. And the economic model that's needed is free trade, capitalism. Hands off, socialists. Just let the government step away from the economy. Government, step away from the economy. <laughs> this is the problem. That if you have people raising the red flag and saying, warning, warning, danger, that there's going to be many more old people, what do they want to do? You know what they want to do. You know what they want to do. They want to increase taxes. They want to take control of your personal finances. They want to be able to say, look, this population catastrophe is coming. Here's my graph that shows the number of children is on the decline. The number of old people is on the increase. Therefore, we're going to have to take control of the economy. Don't worry. We'll look after you like we looked after you in COVID. And when we're in charge, we'll dole out the money. We'll, we'll give welfare to the old people. Now, this is the wrong way of thinking. The right way of thinking is to say, old people are productive. Imagine they, they have imaginations the same as other, other people. I do not plan on retiring, thank you very much, for one. I, I, if people are allowed to be creative, they can be creative through to their dying day. And maybe they won't come a dying day because someone will solve that problem. But this, this pessimism about people, about old people, is ridiculous and unfounded. And it creates depression in people to feel as if they're a burden on society, as if they have nothing left to contribute. Goodness. The, the people I admire most, some of these great scientists, you know, pushing into their 70s, 80s and 90s, still contributing. Look at Roger Penrose. Still going on podcasts. My goodness. Why can't all older people be like that in the limit? Maybe we're going through the last generation of old people who think, who think that what you're aiming for is retirement. What you're aiming for is to do nothing in your final decades. What you're aiming for is uh, not contributing. I, older people now are already on the internet and contributing. They're already being creative. This is changing already. This, this, this way of thinking is, I don't know, it's stuck in the 80s or something or before. That there's a concern that older people are a burden. No, they're not. No, they're not. And if school culture changes, maybe we'll be turning to older people more and more to help educate the young in a new way, a new mode of education and learning that's not coercive and gives you a direct line to the wisest, most knowledgeable people. Wouldn't that be a good way to go? Okay, let's keep going. But we're about to live in that, in the naked now. It's, it feels good until now because as you age, if you're part of the global system, if you have a lot of people in their 40s and 50s, you know, people who have literally been in their careers their whole lives, well, they're very productive. But they've got to export that product in order to make it work. And in a globalized system, you can export from the more advanced aged economies into the younger ones. But that only works until you hit mass retirement. And at that point, you don't just have, 
you don't only lack consumption, you also lack production and investment. Mass retirement, exactly. So why is this concept of retirement even a thing? Well, it's because traditionally people have been used as mules, labor, physical labor. And yeah, sure, the human body gets to a point where it can't do that labor anymore. It needs to retire. It needs to stop doing the heavy lifting, the literal heavy lifting. There are still jobs out there, absolutely, that haven't been automated yet. But increasingly, all of the heavy lifting stuff, the bricklaying, the driving, the, the shelf stacking, name your thing where muscles need to be employed every single day, that's going to be automated by robots. People are minds. And in an economy, in a genuine knowledge economy, a creative economy, which we're building, the, people, the, the generation now know that. They're, they're not aiming to become shelf stackers, maybe for a few months or years while they're making their way through university or maybe while they're trying to find their way in the world. They're aiming for a creative job in whatever way, shape or form that is. They know that it's about using your mind. Insofar as people are driving Ubers now, it's a means to an end on an end in itself. No one is aiming to be an Uber driver for the rest of their life. They might be aiming to start a company that is competing with Uber, People know this. Young people know this. This is the next generation, the generation of creatives that won't want to retire. They want to make whatever the successor to the successor to the successor of TikToks are in their 80s. That's what they'll be doing, educating their grandchildren about stuff via a mode that we can't even imagine now and being paid for it. We are at the beginning of an entirely new economy where retirement won't be an issue. It'll still be an issue for a few decades. There will be a transition phase. But increasingly, the popularity of this idea of retirement will decline. That people will simply not want to. If they want, if they want to have time off, they'll have time off in their 30s and 40s and 50s when they can go on holidays and explore the world and do all that sort of fun stuff while they still have the youth and energy to do that. And then maybe later on, if they haven't gotten body replacement stuff, and probably they will, okay? This is what might happen in the coming decades. That in those decades, you know, they're the final decades, let's say, maybe they won't be doing the physical stuff, but they'll still be doing the creative stuff. What am I doing now? This is not a whole lot of effort. Am I going to... Unless, unless something really happens to the, the brain up here... I can keep on doing this or something like this, something allied to this, into my 70s, 80s, 90s, 100s, 110s, 120s. How much more so is that true for people in there who are toddlers now, teens now, early 20s now? They're going to be way better at knowing how to have fun into their 70s, 80s, 90s, 100s, and not only have fun, but getting paid to do it. And people will want to pay them lots of money for doing whatever it is that they're doing, being creative, teaching a new generation of creators. This is stuck in the 80s at best. This whole analysis that, that, that people have one function and once, they've, once they're unable to perform that function anymore, then they're nothing but a burden is ridiculous. We don't have one function. We don't have one goal. We can create new goals for ourselves. And older people today who've just retired from, let's say, a lifetime of driving trucks, a lifetime of laying bricks, or whatever it happens to be, have access to technology now at very low cost that enables them to become a creator. The retired bricklayer can readily go onto YouTube and share their knowledge about how to lay bricks better and earn, you know, thousands of views, get lots of followers from, you know, uh, home improvers, pe amateurs, people at home who are, who, are, who are building their own house or modifying their own house but don't know how to bricklay yet, but don't want to employ a bricklayer, but can go on YouTube and look at someone who's got a lot of experience in that. For example, pulling something out of my ass. <laughs> okay, but you get my meaning. Whatever the older person has done and has just retired from can now become the wise elder teaching others about how to do it better 
And then there can be competing people, competing bricklayers saying, hey, here's my technique or here's my technique, you know. Uh, and you can go on YouTube and you can look at the different techniques and you can assess which is the better technique or how to catwalk better, how to sing better. You know, people, people who might do it in a funny way, people who might do it in an analytical way. This is what's coming. Never mind generation upon generation upon generation of old people retiring and becoming a burden on society. That's not what I foresee. But the idea that it, it is going to happen that way is pure prophecy. That things won't change. That we extrapolate from what's happened over the last few decades off into the infinite future. Absurd. Absolutely absurd. Okay, just a couple more minutes. You, you get, I think you get the flavour of the episode and what I would say as we go along with particular facts that come out. And that is a position where the Chinese, the Japanese, the Koreans, the Italians, the Belgians, the Germans, and more are all edging into in the first half of this decade. And there is no system that we are aware of, even theoretically, where that works. So we are now at the end of what has been the greatest period of economic growth in human history. And now we get to figure out what's next. Well, so there, there are two... So that's where I'll end it. We're at the end of the greatest period of economic growth in human history. Why are we at the end? Because of what was just said about retirees. Retirees are going to outnumber young people. For the first time, we're going to have this weird inverted pyramid. Now, whether or not that actually happens to be the case, I don't know. But as I say, people are becoming healthier and wealthier and wiser, in particular healthier, so they can work for longer anyway. That's, that's, that's one thing. But anyway... As they become more and more creative, there is no upper limit on how long they can continue to create for. Yes, there are things like dementia and Alzheimer's which might cause a problem. But again, that's also a problem that's soluble. And people will find solutions to those things. Perhaps some of the old people in retirement thinking about these things will be the ones that solve the problem of dementia and Alzheimer's, which would otherwise cause a whole bunch of people who would otherwise be creative, uh, preventing them from being creative because their, their brain has declined in such a way. But maybe also one of the solutions to Alzheimer's and dementia will be people being creative. I don't know enough neuroscience, but I do kind of know that, for example, if people are isolated and not having conversations, they are more prone to dementia. Their brain's not being engaged in stuff, and so therefore it declines. And you tend to have... Alzheimer's and dementia showing up in situations where people are isolated from their family, where they're not eating well, where they're not part of a community, they're not communicating. But if we reverse that, all of that stuff, we change that culture and we have a globally connected community of people that are creative, maybe Alzheimer's and dementia isn't cured, but it begins itself to decline. It begins to recede because we understand the causes the cause of a human being, perhaps, a human being, being a person, being inherently creative, not engaging in creativity, could be the thing, could be the biological reaction of, well, if you're not being sufficiently creative, if you're not being sufficiently creative, the brain just sort of shuts down. Uh, children are just unbounded in their creativity, and so their brain is so active all the time. And as we get older, maybe that, that declines and that causes this, 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 this horrible cycle, this reinforcement of um, not being creative, brain decline, wanting to be less creative, brain decline and so on and so forth. Maybe that will reverse. Now, might not be an actual, <laughs> an actual solution to, add to dementia, let's say, but it could be a part of it. And anyway, whatever the solution to any of these things is, is creativity. So I think that's where we'll, um, where we'll end it today. Uh, the... The remainder of what I hear are specifics, facts about things like the decline in, you know, or any number of things, the, the, the US economy on various metrics, the US military on various metrics, and as if these are pointing to some deeper decay in not just the US, but civilization more broadly. It's, it's certainly a pervasive idea that America's in decline, America's a force for kind of evil. People are stupid and voting the wrong way. Um, enjoy it while you can because the worst is yet to come. Uh, it's, 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 yeah. As I started uh, laughing at, with this episode about 
uh, just how ridiculous it sounds in light of what we understand about how knowledge is produced, what physics is telling us, what science is telling us, what books like The Beginning of Infinity and thinkers like David Deutsch uh, are telling us about reality and how, how, why things have gotten better and therefore why we, should con- why we should think that things are going to continue to get better because we people solve problems, we people create knowledge, we people correct errors. And that's our nature and that won't change and that will continue to make things better. And I'm happy to take the bet <laughs> from anyone that over the next 100 years, or 100 years from now we'll look back and see that 2022 was way, 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 way worse, good as it was, way, 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 way worse than the year 21, 22. Anyway, until next time, bye-bye.